Ready. Good morning, everyone. Today is the ninth day of evidentiary hearings in EFSB 22-03, DPU docket 22-21. Um, we are resuming today, um, I believe, with questions for the company's witnesses. However, if anyone has anything that they need to bring up that should be on the record before we start, please let me know. Seeing none. Um, Mr. Wong, I know I interrupted you um, at the end of the day on Wednesday um, when you had questions pending to Mr. Zico. Yes, thank, thank you, Ms. Strachey. Um, Mr. Zico, if you're here, I'd like to resume. I I am here. Uh, I'm just getting getting my materials opened up. Thank you. Um, they are open. I'm, thank you. So I'm going to be referring back to the exhibit that um, you were talking about on Wednesday. And that is exhibit EFSB dash SU dash 12 parens two. And I'll, I'll be sharing my screen again. So for the transcript, this exhibit that I'm referring to is a presentation about the computational fluid dynamics um, analysis done for the exhaust of um, the substation in. Cambridge. Okay. So Mr. Zico, um, I'm on page 20 of 36 of that document. And you can either follow along on the screen or you can um, use your own. But basically, I just want a confirmation of a couple things depicted in this drawing. Um, are you ready to answer? Yes. Yeah, so uh, this is really helpful with the with the humans um, in the drawing. I just I was just wondering. There's there's no scale here. So um, what is the height of basically? How am I understanding the the um, dimensions in this drawing? Yeah, I I do not um, I do not recall what the height of the people depicted depicted are. Um, so unfortunately, I can't I can't answer your question. And you're correct that this there is no there is no scale on this per se. Uh, but what the the intent of this illustration was that a person of height that I can't state at the ground level to to illustrate what they would um, they would experience. Mr. Zico, would that be a pretty easy thing to 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 do a record request on, just to to confirm what the the scale of this? I can, drawing is? if 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 a record request were made, I would have to go back to exponent, but I'm you know, they would they would be the people who would best uh, be in the best position to say what that scale is. Okay, so um, just so I I just want the record to be clear. So I think if you could do that, that would be great. So I'm I'm sorry. I just want to ask, Mr. Wong, are you asking for yes. a copy of this to be provided with scale indicators, um, or are you asking for for a particular height for the people, or for any of the lines that appear in the boxes in the middle of the diagram? Uh -huh. I think the most helpful thing would be to have a scale on this diagram. Is that, do you think that would be possible, Mr. Zico? I, I, well, I, I can't speak for exponent. We'll go back and ask them. I am speculating that they'll be able to do it. Uh, and it would probably be best served if we were to have them provide a scale bar so that as people, 
you know, zoom in and zoom out, um, they don't lose, they don't lose scale. I think that's a good idea, Mr. Zico. Thank you. So that would be record request EFSB 32. Thank you. Um, so a little bit further on this diagram, speaking of um, scale measurements, um, I was wondering, Mr. Zico, if you could describe um, basically if there's any cutoff points in both of these measurements for velocity and temperature where you might think that the temperatures or velocity of, of um, exhaust would be harmful to to a person. We we had not uh, we had not done that because all of the uh, illustrations that were provided showed that the uh, the the person of a to be determined height uh, would not be in the plume that was different from the that the ambient air and and was only as you can see on the velocity side the left hand side you can see that it was you know down around down in the low end of the uh, the spectrum of uh, air velocities. Okay. Um, so I I guess um, to 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 understand this more clearly for myself um, would, for example, if if the plume were to be in contact with a human, would harm be be a a factor of both velocity and temperature or or would a for example a slow velocity plume that's really high temperature also be harmful is that is that something that's able to be described well i mean i i'm not i'm not an an expert on the you know the physiological effects on humans but i i can say that in you know in general um you know temperatures temperatures that are are closer to the ambient um and wind speeds that are are you know in in the low end would tend to be more comfortable i i don't know what uh how i could speak to you know what it, what it would cause harm i think if if somebody were to be in a you know 108 degree uh air pocket okay, and and we're doing physical work they would certainly need to take precautions to prevent becoming overheated but the exact physiological effect on them i i don't know that i could speak to because it would vary with the individual thank you i i, I think i appreciate that um that characterization i i just wanted um since you know the the color red in this in this scale is 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 quite eye-catching so i i was just figuring if that that meant had any signifier on hazard or, or danger. Um, it, when, when these were prepared, we did not, um, you know, cor correlate it with, with hazard or danger. We, we chose the, or the colors were chosen so that, you know, we, we could show the contrast. You, you can see, um, and on, on the temperature side, you can see that the, the red area um, is, you know, is well away from the from the people that are depicted and the people are in the, the blue area closer to the ambient. It was more, I think, to show contrast than anything. Thank you. So final uh, question on, on this would be, and I, and I know that the modeling doesn't show this, but if a model showed that the, the plume would be in contact with, with um, a person on the ground, would the mitigation just be to figure out how to redirect that plume away from people? There, yes. And what what doesn't what doesn't show on um, this, but was modeled, was that uh, where the where the air exits the exhaust shaft, there are louvers, and you know those those louvers can have the the, the fixed louvers now, but you know uh, louvers with different different angles could be provided. Um, okay, um, and that would that would serve to direct the air. So, Mr. Zico, you're saying the louvers um, are designed 
um, to 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 be there um, right now. There, there, there are louvers factored into the model of this. Yes. Okay, um, Mr. Zico, I think my colleague Ms. Devakar wants to follow up. Thank you, Mr. Wang. Um, good morning, Mr. Zico. Um, good morning. I have a follow a follow up. Uh, I understand that exponent is are um, responsible for the modeling, uh, even if maybe it requires uh, getting back to them on the kind of information I'm seeking. But I'd still ask you the question now. Uh, it would really help. So from this diagram that we see here, which is a scenario which does not consider wind velocities, there is uh, at least on the you know right hand side of the diagram wherein the temperatures are shown, on the surface of the exhaust, temperatures seem to be quite high. So if any anyone were to kind of uh, be in touch <laughs> with those surfaces, but, and from this diagram, I would assume that it is harmful, but we would really like exponent to be talking to these effects because in terms of what the impacts are, clearly the impacts are caused either just by temperature, by velocity itself, or by a combination of velocity and temperatures. Uh, so for the two scenarios, I understand that you have had uh, constraints uh, modeling more than those scenarios, but at least for the two scenarios that are discussed here, really appreciate uh, some kind of uh, description of what, how, what the impacts are. So if these are the levels of temperature, these are the levels of velocity, and this is the kind of distance of separation from the surface of the exhaust what would the impacts be for humans around the exhaust? So can I just um, interject, is your question just with regard to this particular diagram or some of the others related to the exhaust that we've been reviewing? So, um, Shakti, uh, what um, the company has presented are two scenarios. And they have ha they have their limitations presenting additional scenarios because the design is not complete yet. What but they, uh, the design around the plaza is not complete yet, or at least the company is not aware of what the existing um, you know situation is with those designs. So even if uh, we were to interpret the two scenarios that the company has presented, we would like more information regarding what these more what the model. Uh, would translate to when you talk about impacts to humans. It clearly shows the temperature ranges. It clearly shows the velocities around the exhaust. But it does not speak to if this was the scenario, how does it affect the humans? And what distances of separation would be safe for humans? So if the company through exponent, if required, could speak to these impacts, it would be really helpful. Can I add um, a piece to Mr. Zico's testimony, Ms. Divakar? Um, so the, and I believe we referenced this, so I'm sorry if I'm being repetitive. The analysis that was undertaken was to address the comfort analysis that Boston Properties needs to undertake when doing their permitting with the city of Cambridge to ensure that residents and users of the property are in fact safe. So I, I think we can go back and look at what all of those pieces are. Um, but I, and we can go back and look at what all those pieces are and point you in the direction and include the information that's been put um, in front of the city of Cambridge from Boston Properties. So I think that's really what you're getting at. And um, these are the exhaust plumes, but there are facades and other components being put around the these exit shafts that um, will also further um, move people away and those designs are not completed. So I think we can give you a summary of how people are protected in this scenario and what other things we'll be doing in the future to ensure their protection. And then also tie that together with what the city of Cambridge is asking of Boston properties. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
uh, that helps. But okay. and, well, let I, me, I, let I, me, yeah. please go ahead, Mr. I, no, I, I'd, I'd like to add one thing that, or one or two things that may help um, you frame your question, Ms. Divakar. So if you, I'm, and I'm on, I'm on page 20 of 36 of the attachment that they've been working off of. And if you look at the, if you look at the right hand side, there are some people there, or, you know, models of people. And then if you go over to the left, there is a double, double line mm -hmm. in the vertical plane. And then to the left of that, there is a solid line that's in the vertical plane. Mm -hmm. The space between those two lines where you see that large red plume is uh, not accessible to the general public. So that's where the bulk of the, the 108 degree air is. Um, and then as, as a reference point, you know, 108 degrees, what is that? It, it, uh, as, as a reference point, the upper limit um, of setting for, for domestic, the domestic hot water systems that you'd have in your house are 120 degrees. So, you know, that, that'll give us at least a frame of reference to, to work off of. That, that, that is clarifying. That helps. So, uh, so um, talking to what uh, Mr. Benjamin's uh, offered. Now, my only reservation with that is the city of Cambridge approves, but is not the a technical expert as much as I know. That's that's the reason you um, you know uh, consulted with exponent on this matter. So coming from that perspective. I'd like exponents, uh, you know, take on what the impacts are for these two scenarios. I understand that you are not in a position to discuss the rest of the scenarios wherein you have every information, BXP has every information of what is the design around it. But at least for these scenarios wherein you're just considering without wind and with wind velocities, I'd like a better explanation coming from the technical expert, which is exponent in this case. And they also have the health experts. So I think they can, we can close the loop for you, you on that. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks very much. Yeah. So is the company clear on the scope of what Ms. Divakar is asking for in this record request? I believe we are, yes. Thank you, Mr. Zico. Thank you, Ms. Benjamins. And thank you, Mr. Vine. You're welcome. So that is record request EFSB 33. Thank you. Um, for quick confirmation, I, I'm not, I don't think this would be the case, but um, do you, Mr. Zico, uh, could you, and understanding that, that you're not the, the CFD computational fluid dynamics um, expert here, but um, do you expect that the exhaust from the substation would, would contain any pollutants or any elevated um, levels of, of um, gases that, that might not be found in normal air? No, no, I do not. Uh, we are not, um, we're not burning anything in there. This is not, this is not a generating station. The only, um, the only, um, combustion process per se would be if and when the emergency generator is either running or being tested and that is vented uh the the exhaust from that is vented through a different a different stack it does not come out it does not come out with the, the ventilation air of the station the only other scenario that i could could conceive of would be if there were a a leak in the um gas-filled equipment, sulfur hexafluoride filled equipment within the station. Uh, but that would become so diluted that by the time that it, it reached the outside air that uh, I don't I don't see that it would get to a, uh, a problematic level for human exposure. Thank you. So Mr. Um, Mr. Zico, if there were a fire within the underground substation, can you tell me where that smoke would be vented? The smoke, uh, yeah, in, in the event of a fire, each each area of the station, so each transformer vault, reactor vault, switchgear room, control room, et cetera, has its own um, 
intake and exhaust fan that that do um, uh, take the supply and discharge into a common duct system that terminates in this in this intake and exhaust shaft. If there were a fire, the fire alarm system is wired to Clo shut the shut the fans off for the particular zone where the smoke is detected, as well as close as well as close the dampers. The fire would then be be dealt with um, either you know with extinguishers locally or through the fire suppression systems that we've installed, and then the smoke on, on top of this ventilation system. There's a smoke evacuation system that's manually. Uh, activated, uh, and that would be done under the direction of the Cambridge Fire Department. So is it correct then that it would not be vented through these same exhaust stacks if there were to be as part of the the um, evacuation system a need for the smoke to be vented to clear the um, area of the in which the fire was located within the substation. So the, any any smoke that is the result of a fire within a given within a given space um, would be vented only manually. It would come out as it would come out in a much lower velocity than what what we see depicted here, and it would uh, that manual activation of that system would be done under the direction of the Cambridge Fire Department. But would the venting be through these same exhaust stacks? The, the, they, this is the only um, exit from the station for exhaust air, yes. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt, Mr. Wong. No, thank you. Um, I, I guess um, the, the reason I asked that question um, was um, it, it, it seems like, well, not it seems, the, 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 the reason for these exhausts, uh, this exhaust uh, shaft is to, 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 to release hot air produced in the, the substation, is that correct? It's, it's to remove the heat produced by the operation of the electrical equipment in the substation, yes. Thank you. So, Granted, I, I I don't think um, that this this happens um, in a, in an not an above ground, but correct me if I'm wrong. But is is there has Eversource considered or talked with BXP about sort of in a way recycling that that hot air, not hot air, that the the heat to be used for other purposes at BXP? We we had. Um looked at that early on in the design and there there are a couple couple of challenges at least at least today this is a this is a summer peaking facility so we would need to have a source of heat a source a, a sink for that heat and i'm you know it wasn't it wasn't certain that we would be able to find a a, a sink of process heat of enough size uh, to get to get rid of that, to get rid of that heat, we would also need to provide because the station, the station would need to operate independently from the uh, the need for heat. There would also have to be a, a, a parallel ventilation system or heat rejection system in case that in case that heat sink were not available. If that heat sink were not available, if there were trouble with a circulating pump or some other piece of hardware, we would still need to be able to operate the station and serve load. So we, we would have ended up with two stations, uh, I'm sorry, two ventilation systems, and it just was not a uh, practical solution at this time. Okay, so if I'm understanding right, if hypothetically the heat could be used in the winter, you would still have to find a way to to get rid of it in the summer in a different system. It in a different system, and if it were if it were a you know mild day in the winter, if we if we had one of those rare you know sixty or seventy degree days in in February, uh, we would still need to get rid of the heat from on those days as well. Thank you. Um, 
I, this is, is probably the last question I have on, on these diagrams, but um, just really quickly, I noticed um, just scrolling through that the, the um, temperatures, the temperature here is 70, the dark blue, and in the, the initial no wind diagram, the temperature was 95. Um, Mr. Zico, to your knowledge, do you know if the models um, included the the weather, uh, sorry, that the temperature uh, outside as well? The, the, the models include, you know, as, as stated on the different, um, the, the, the different scenarios, you know, it, it, it takes into account different, different temperatures and, and wind speeds. Now it's not, it's not possible to model every, every scenario, uh, because we're, we're in a natural environment here, but yes, they did assume various ambient temperatures in the study, combinations of ambient temperatures and wind speeds. Thank you. I, I overlooked that. Okay. So, um, Last question on these slides. Um, I'm on page eight of the 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 PowerPoint. Um, hopefully, this is not a secret diagram. This is unredacted. So, um, just looking at this slide, uh, I see the proposed underground substation in the middle of the plaza and two buildings. Um, abutting the the structure. So my question is, uh, are there structural connections between these three different structures, or are they independent of each other? There, there, there are um, some structural connections, if you will. So I'm looking at the building that says 135 Broadway, and on the right hand. On the right hand side, you can see some some numbers. Uh, and if you follow that that wall all the way down, uh, you can see that it bears on of the I'll call it the left hand wall of the substation vault. Yep. I see. So it. that's a, a, a more or less a you know that, that that wall is sharing the load of what's above. It's retaining the earth as well as holding up part of 135 Broadway and it's a similar similar situation with 290 Binney if you follow there's a a somewhat diagonal line if you follow that down uh, you can see that it makes contact with the uh, top of the right hand wall of the substation right hand vertical wall and those are all those are all engineered to take those loads so that's it's planned for in the design Thank you. That's really helpful. Um, okay, so now I'd like to point um, the witnesses and Mr. Zico to exhibit EFSB SU 11. And let me know when you're ready to, to talk about that. Did you say exhibit or information request? Information request EFSB SU 11. Okay. Thank you. I have that in front of me. Thank you. So, um, in this information request, staff asked about vibration levels um, of the buildings above the new substation and from sorry sorry so the, we're, we're asking about the effects of vibration from the substation to to above the substation yes i see that yeah So um, at the la at the last sentence, uh, Mr. Zico, you talk about a 1.5 megawatt emergency generator, which is which, if, if I'm understanding right, that does cause detectable vibrations. No, um, I'm 
I didn't intend to say that at all. So the the equipment the equipment that's going to be in the substation, se- segregating out the emergency generator for one moment, is exactly the same as what we use in in other installations. The transformers are the same. The reactors are the same. The switchgear is the same. We own a number of stations that have party walls with uh, other facilities, hotels, uh, shelters, parking garages, uh, and we do not have, uh, and, and retail locations as well. We do not have any um, any complaints of vibration from those, so we're basing it on that. In addition, this station is going to be in in a box underground uh, so that that ground, uh, the, the soil surrounding the, the box is going to absorb some of the vibration as well. We'll absorb the energy from that. Now, when you factor in the, the one and a half megawatt emergency generator, A, it's not going to be on all the time. Uh, it'll, it'll be on for a test. Um, and it will be on in the event of a total total station power outage, uh, which we, we certainly hope we, we never need it for. At that point in time, um, you know, I, I would not, I would not expect that the one and a half megawatt emergency generator would cause any discernible vibration at grade level because it's it's going to be down. Um, it's going to be down below grade, and it will be on. You know, the, these machines come with vibration isolators as well. Thank you. And I, um, just so I'm clear, um, the way this question was asked was about human detection. I, I guess that that leads to my next question, which is, um, do you think there'd be any vibration that could, you know, be there, but just not detected? For, for example, could it affect structural, um, the, the structures? So I'll, I, I, I will go back to, you know, what I had testified to earlier is that, you know, we have we have additional we have other stations that are in above ground buildings that have party walls with other non-utility structures, and they've been in in service for many many decades, and there have been no uh, no reported structural issues that I'm aware of. And again, the emergency generator uh, is the same. It's the same machine that's used in in many commercial buildings, so that you know if they if by extension it's it's fair to say that if these machines aren't causing issues with commercial buildings they won't be causing an issue here either thank you um and to confirm um has this been discussed with um the xp at all there, there have been num- numerous meetings between uh, the company and Boston Properties, as as well as the respective engineering teams, on this on the subject of how to engineer this facility. So, if there, if 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 the, those the topic of vibration may have come up in one of those meetings, I'm just I'm just not aware of it, but. Um, Certainly, there have been there's been ample opportunity to discuss it, and I think it's also fair to say that the um, vibration from the construction of the vault and the surrounding commercial and residential buildings will be more than what you would get from the operation of the substation and its associated equipment. Thank you. I appreciate the additional um, explanations. Okay, I'm going to move on to another topic. Um, this was a question we asked um, the project alternatives, sorry, the project need uh, panel, and they told us to ask this of the engineering panel. So I'm just gonna ask this. Um, so um, I don't think we need a reference, but I'm I'm looking at the analysis at page 3-18. And I think basically what's described there is that there could be multiple there could be a multiple day outage event um and what i want is for the record if if you could describe 
or elaborate on um, a scenario where there's a multiple day outage event? And also in that response, could you state why it could take 30 days or more? So I, I would I would like to have that reference in front of me, and I'm yep. I'm looking for it now. So if you would bear with me for a second, that was page three seventeen, three eighteen, and 3 I believe dash eighteen. Thank you. Yep, and I believe the company also has a little more description at three twenty six. I'm looking for more than that. Okay. So take your time, Mr. Zico. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, I forgot to say this, but. Um, my question is directed at the entire panel. So if anyone has an answer, please feel free to top in. I, I don't want to just um, have Mr. Zico uh, feel like he has to answer everything. So that was a good, I, I apologize. That was page 317? 18, 1, 8. 18, 1, 8. Okay. And that, that, is in the context of transmission contingencies. Um, That's right. So they they're talking they're talking specifically about the um, Putnam load pocket. You, I see in the first sentence transmission supply of the Putnam slash Cambridge. I, I, load I'm pocket. sorry. I see in the. I'm sorry. I see in the first sentence what. I'm sorry. In in the first sentence of. 3.4.1.2, it says, in the event of an N minus one minus one contingency to the transmission supply to the Putnam slash Cambridge load pocket, uh, and then it continues. What, what that intends to convey is that the, the transmission supply coming into the Putnam area and the East Cambridge area as it's configured today consists of two two lines and if those were two and they're high pressure fluid filled lines and if they were both if, if say one were out of service and the other one service of plan work the other one were to become damaged uh, or they were both to become damaged simultaneously it would be a it would be a long-term repair and I would probably defer to um, Mr. Abdullah or Ms. Klein to elaborate more on exactly how the, those repairs are made. Uh, sure. I'm also looking for the reference, but I can um, speak in general to uh, like a line repair um, on a um, pipe type cable circuit. Um, so just in general, um, you know, if there's a fault or some kind of an outage, a dig in, a third third party dig in, et cetera. Um, typically, you know, first you're looking to locate your fault through, um, you know, various testing means. Um, if it's not obvious from, you know, a release of fluid, you know, given you proximity, because initially we would have operations folks drive the line to see if there's anything at the service that can be detected. If um, if there wasn't like a breach in the pipe as a result of the energy that, um, you know, kind of impacts the structural integrity of the pipe wall itself, then, um, you know, we would uh, do some testing from the station and typically a um, TDR test, which is a time domain reflectometry. Um, if the fault hadn't necessarily burned through so to speak, then we may do some um, thumping of that cable because the pipe type cable is typically a self-healing cable. And so um, we would try to burn through the fault and then go back to a, a TDR test to locate the fault. And what that kind of does, the we baseline the profile of the conductor itself um, to get a signature like in waveform and at the discontinuities like splices and terminations, we would get a um, change in that signature. And if based on the, you know, distance that we've measured, uh, we are looking to locate like an anomaly that falls outside of where we know from a um, distance standpoint, these splices and terminations are, 
um, that helps us to kind of pinpoint where the fault is. Once we do that, the um, uh, team would look to excavate on either side of the manhole to manhole segment or termination to manhole segment. You would need to excavate in order to um, solidify the fluid internal to the pipe. So you would wrap some copper coils around and pump nitrogen um, fluid, liquefied uh, nitrogen through the um, copper wire in order to solidify or freeze the oil. Um, you would uh, cut a hole in the pipe uh, once you've kind of figured out, once you've excavated at the actual fault location, um, you have you know would wrap some film and, and, and X-ray the pipe to, to confirm that you've located the actual fault in the cable and then um, drain the fluid from that segment, uh, break apart the splice at each end with the freeze pits on the extremities at the extent of the um, work zone, um, pull the cable out, um, manhole to manhole, pull the cable back in, uh, re-splice, refill, and um, thaw the uh, um, freezes that you've established, and then raise the uh, pressure in the line back up to nominal 200 pounds per square inch of pressure. So, Thank and, you. and again, again, just to amplify a bit on what Mr. Abdullah just said, it's, you know, I think he, he painted a, a, a good um, picture of why HPFF cable repair is a time, time consuming process. The other thing I'll add is that the fault locating process is very difficult as well, just to, just because of the electrical nature of the, uh, um, of the pipe type cable itself, it, it acts like a big capacitor that tends to um, cloud some of the fault locating technologies that we now have. One of the other things that this that the proposed project will do is that the supplies into the um, into the proposed new substation will be all crosslink poly, which tends to have a a shorter repair time. Uh, it will also reconfigure the transmission system into the Putnam and East Cambridge area to provide additional supplies so that it, it's not relying on two, um, two uh, HPFF cables. The final thing that I would like to add is that it's not just a transmission supply that can cause outages. Um, there could be a there could be a failed a failed transformer um, that could take up up to a month to replace depending on depending on the size of the of the unit and transportation constraints so this the new facility uh the way it's proposed will help to uh you know provide additional supplies into the area or additional transformation in the area so that the impact of of a failure is not uh is is not as severe it's it's easier to manage yeah to to add to that, you know, just from a cable standpoint, as we talk through the difference in um, cable technologies, um, this insulation being solid dielectric, each phase is in its own uh, conduit. So when there is a fault, the replacement is of one single phase, as opposed to for pipe type cable, when you have a uh, fault on a cable, on a conductor, you're pulling out all three phases from the single pipe. Um, so that's another reason, um, you know, some of it could be sourcing the material and having spares on hand. Um, so that's a, that's another reason for, um, a speedier, a repair. Thank you, Mr. Abdullah and Mr. Zico. Um, Mr. Abdullah, you said something about pipe thumping. Is that a physical action of just hitting the pipe? I'm sorry. Yeah, no, it's a table. So you're you're um, basically um, sending a voltage to the cable to like burn through the actual conductor because in the in the case of um, pipe type cables sometimes because it's in fluid you know the uh, like John said or Mr Zico said it's um, difficult sometimes to locate the actual fault and the dielectric medium is fluid under pressure. And so as there's a gap 
in the uh, the conductor itself, the fluid kind of finds its way into the conductor. And so it may not be apparent upon your initial uh, TDR test or if you try to bridge from the station ends. So sometimes there's a need to send a signal so that you're kind of um, burning through where the fault is because that's the weak point of the conductor. And so the um, uh, current is looking to get to ground. Yeah. And so it will travel through that path and it kind of um, burns through at that location. But you just call it thumping because sometimes when you're uh, looking for a fault, they might have an acoustic detection uh, um, um, apparatus at the street surface with an operator kind of walking the area. And you might hear the thumping um, from that arc um, that's being sent. Thank you. So, yeah, so Mr. Thank Wong, you. basically, the, it, it's the, it's it, it discharges a series of pulses into the cable. And as Mr. Abdullah said, it will serve to, in this case, serve to help break down the insulation. And it's it's called the thumper because, as Mr. Abdullah alluded, a person with this acoustic device above the above the line may be able to hear a thumping noise underground. Appreciate the the explanation. Um, Mr. Zico, uh, just just to confirm, um, we talked about the, the, the XLPE versus HPFF um, type cables. Are most of the existing cables in the area HPFF pipe type cables? Yes, they are. Thank you. And both Mr. Abdullah and Mr. Zico, you talked about how the XLPE versions could have a shorter uh, repair period. Could you could you give me a general idea of what those two types of um, cable repair periods would be in in your experience? Yeah, uh, so the so, actual uh, durations may. I, I'm sorry. Be, the actual what? durations the actual durations if if i were to think about it comparatively right and and not having specific durations i would i would kind of with a pipe type cable the anomaly right separate from the solid dielectric cable is i need to excavate so i need to dig the road up on both ends of the manhole to manhole segment where we have found the actual fault right i need to um, disassemble the steel pipe that's surrounding the splice, like cut through the, the, the steel pipe. I need to drain the fluid. I need to re remove the pipe type cable, three phases, right? Break, break apart each one of those splices, remove them, and, you know, put all three phases back in, build all three splices back up and weld as opposed to on the solid dielectric, you're accessing the system through the manholes. You're not digging in the street. You are disassembling one splice per manhole because there's one phase that has been impacted typically, unless for some reason there has been a failure at the splice and there could be an impact from the uh, um, one splice phase to another, right? which is rare, but, it, you know, that could happen. And so, you know, comparatively, that that's that's where the, um, the increase in duration comes from. It's the civil work and it's the craft work to disassemble the pipe, remove the fluid, disassemble the three phases of splices, you know, et cetera, and then rebuild. So, uh, you know, it, it, it depending on how you phase your work, it could be less than a third plus like of that time because you could be excavating and in the manhole doing the you know breakdown of the weld etc but those are the kind of um the items that you'll need to um to address prior to the repair but the testing the um splicing you know etc would be the same 
except for you're doing one phase instead of three. Yeah. The, well, I'll, I'll just uh, just to kind of put, put some numbers around or, or some durations around what Mr. Abdullah just said. Uh, you know, I if, if I were to characterize it, I would say that the, you know, repair duration for an HPFF circuit would be measured in months. Um, and the repair duration for a cross-link poly circuit uh, would be uh, likely measured in weeks. Yeah, I Thank agree you. with that. Yeah. Thank you. That, that was really helpful. Um, okay, so I'm going to, recognizing that Ms. Klein has a has a uh, cutoff, I, I, I'll ask this question um, first. I, I hope this is the right panel. But um, could you give me just one second, Wayne, please? Yeah. I have a technical issue. Just a second. Okay. Nope. Thank you. Yep. So, um, in the past week and the week before, there was a lot of discussion about the company's preferred route along Vassar, and in comparison to the MIT's proposed route to go along Grand Junction Corridor. Um, I wanted to to just get a feel of um, how those two compared to the company's noticed alternative route along Memorial Drive. I just wanted to to see. You know, we've talked a lot about how the that the the company's preferred route in terms of engineering is way more advanced than the MIT's proposed variation. I just wanted to to see if if the notice alternative is where it stands in terms of its engineering as well. Sure, I'd be happy to respond to that question. Um, both for this project, both the preferred and the notice alternative routes for all of the proposed alignments were developed to the same level of engineering. So that includes going, you know, getting the quality level B survey and developing a full plan and profile design versus the MIT routes, which utilized some survey from some projects and JS data and were basically a schematic review uh, of the alignments where they're proposing. Thank you, Ms. Klein. Um, does anyone else have anything else to add before I move on to the next um, sub question on that? Actually, Can we go yeah. off the record for, for, for a minute, please? Uh, sure. Off the record? Sorry to interrupt. Uh, Wayne. Okay. Um, we do have additional examination that would probably be in part Ms. Klein and, you know, as we approach 11 o'clock and she has a departure time at 12, I'm hoping that, um, and I'm not trying to cut off the staff's examination, they have to ask their question for sure, but that there would be sufficient time to uh, allow us to do further examination of our witnesses, including Ms. Klein, um, before she needs to leave. And I think some of that will get to your question, Mr. Wong. Okay. Um, how, do, do you know how long, how much time you need, Mr. Rosenzweig? I, I would say 15 or 20 minutes, more or less. I mean, I, less than an hour, but I'm only noting it now so that <laughs> it doesn't get to 10 minutes or 12 and we say uh, shucks. Um, so there, there, there's a little bit of time, but I wouldn't want to uh, miss the opportunity either. I appreciate so, that. So, yeah. David, are you talking about doing essentially targeted redirect for Allison? Um, yeah, and, and Jamil may be a part of that too, but she's going to carry a good portion of that, yes. Okay. Um, could, could we let Mr. Rec, I think he wanted to speak up, and then I, I will, we can. Then we can, can take a break and try and do the redirect um, you know, to, to make sure you get your questions in for Allison and any kind of follow-up that might be related to her. Yeah. Would that would that be procedurally messy, Donna, or is that okay? No, that I mean, as long as um you know we can go back to address the rest of the um okay. questions for for the rest of the panel. And I think there may be some areas that would overlap with things that maybe otherwise Allison would, you know, respond to, but, you know, presumably Jamil and some of the other members of the panel would still be available. So 
maybe sure. we can we can handle it that way. Yeah, I would just also I don't think we'll need a break. We could you know whatever. I know Wayne has some questions, and I think Chuck Chuck wanted to add something to the prior question and answer. But um, once once the transition occurs, we could we could do that immediately. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't and I break, know but... Alan and I need a break too. Yeah. Remember, so right. that yeah. we'll have to fit that in there too. Yeah, I was going to say that. I, I don't need a break, but I think Alan should, you know, let us know. If Ms. Klein needs to leave at noon, I'm happy to go until noon. Okay, Before thank you for accommodating us, Alan. I sure. appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, uh, Wayne, do you have any, or, or frankly, the rest of the panel have anything that's Kind of more specifically targeted to. Are we Alan? on the record? No, we're not. Thank okay. you, Thank you. Alan. I'm just trying to figure out how to okay. structure. Thanks. Um, I. So, I have this set of questions that that pertain to to just understanding the notice alternative. Um, and then, I don't know if this is this would be a Miss Klein. Um answer, but I had some questions about public public shade trees and, and heat island effect. I don't know, know if that's um, requires maybe Ms. Klein more, to be here. Maybe more Maya and and Chris and, and, and Mike Howard. Yeah, yeah, unless it's, you know, unless you were getting into maybe construction issues related to Chuck. the shade tree. Okay. <laughs> right, right. Uh, if no. I don't you come up once I'm gone, I, I, I'm Fully confident that Jamil will be able to answer in my absence. <laughs> and he's thrilled about that prospect. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> but yeah, so I, I really foresee it's just these notice alternative questions. I believe Ms. DeVacker had her camera on. Do you have something that is related? I just wanted to uh, know if Ms. Klein would be available during the cleanup sessions. The un unscheduled one. She not if it's next uh, Thursday, but um, conceivably if we were to do the thirteenth, and I haven't heard on scheduling issue. I did check with Allie on the thirteenth, and I think Allie, you just confirmed for me you are available on the thirteenth. I can be available anytime after I'm back on the thirteenth. So the thirteenth and beyond, I can make myself available. Yes, and presumably you'd have other constraints for other members of the panel too to mm -hmm. deal with. So. Right. Right. Okay, let's go back on the record then. Wayne, could you resume yes. and we'll try and get Ms. Klein off and on. Yeah, so I, I think Mr. Rack was going to follow up and then um, Mr. Rosen, so I uh, had contemplated targeted um, redirect. That's right. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Wang. Uh, in terms of Ms. Klein's statement on the status of engineering, I, I completely agree, but I did want to um, add to that, that our focus has certainly been uh, to advance the design and the focus of the company's preferred routes, uh, both uh, in terms of our discussions ongoing with the city and the outside agencies and uh, we have been performing and uh, that is an ongoing activity. Um, it, we, we've been performing test pits and geotech investigation to further advance the designs, again, with focus on the company's preferred routes. Uh, the focus of those conversations and the test pitting and the geotech have not been advanced with regards to the notice alternative routes. I just wanted to make that clarification. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll follow up later on, um, but Mr. Rosenzweig? If you would like to do your targeted redirect for, for Ms. Klein right now, and um, we can hopefully free up her schedule. I, I, I appreciate it. Um, and these questions are for Ms. Klein, but uh, I think also they'll be in part um, areas that Mr. Abdul may uh, provide some additional context. Um, and so I'll try to get through it as quickly as we can. Um, panel, do you recall being questioned by Mr. DeTori on Wednesday regarding the proximity of Eversource's 
proposed transmission line alignment on Vassar Street to the steam line infrastructure? Yes, I do. Yes. And, and likewise, do you recall um, testifying previously that the proximity to heat producing infrastructure was a reliability concern of yours, among other concerns, regarding MIT's proposed alternative along the Grand Junction North to Albany Street segment? Yes, I do. Yes. For the record, could you please describe what consideration the company takes into account to design its transmission facilities in the most reliable manner? There are a number of factors regarding reliability that are taken into account in designing a transmission line, and I'd stress that none of these factors are assessed in a vacuum. Each needs to be weighed and assessed, first during route selection and then during more detailed design efforts. These factors include minimizing proximity to adjacent heat sources wherever possible, and where we can't, we're ensuring that the impact and the opacity rating is limited, achieving geographic diversity, at least 10 foot separation from adjacent transmission duct banks, I'm sorry, Minimum, at least at least what? At least what? 10 foot separation from adjacent transmission duct banks, minimizing the number of S curves and tight bends, minimizing the number of splice points wherever possible, and minimizing pulling tensions and sidewall pressures. As the design is developed, if any of these issues can't be avoided at any specific point along the alignment, the design is adjusted to account for it to ensure line reliability. To develop a reliable transmission line, we first start with developing the design criteria, identifying the rating requirement for the circuit. Any design we develop and install needs to be able to achieve that impacity level at a minimum. Before any routing design is initiated, a high level review is completed to assess the expected size of cable and how many cables per phase is expected to be required for the installation to meet the required impacity. At each stage of design, we will confirm that the design can still meet this impacity need and adjust as necessary. At this time, quality level D survey, which is a compilation and plotting of available record data, is obtained to feed the review of technical aspects of the routing analysis and selection of candidate routes, specifically the identification of open corridors, estimates of utility congestion, identifying locations of adjacent heat sources, etc. Once the Ms. top Pine? I'm sorry, could you slow down just a little bit? Because the tendency is to speak more quickly when you're reading. Apologies. Thank you, though. Apologies, I will. Once the top two routes for each alignment are chosen from the set of candidate routes, the company obtains quality level C survey for those routes. For level C, a field survey is performed to locate any above ground evidence of points indicating the location of the underground utilities. This would include manholes, catch basins, gate valves, etc. The level C data is plotted and at this stage the original level D data is adjusted to the field locations identified. This data is used to develop the initial plan alignments for the top two routes for each alignment. At this point in design we're developing the route in the horizontal plane and identifying initial possible manhole locations based on preliminary polling calculations. We would also start to assess possible required trenchless crossing locations and continue to evaluate whether the design we are developing can still meet the impacity need. This is done by identifying possible fuse points along the route and ensuring that the installation would still be able to achieve the required impacities at these locations. As previously outlined in earlier testimony, these are locations along the route where we expect that heat dissipation from the circuit will be most challenging. Until the profile is developed, we're making conservative assumptions based on our experience, expected depths, offsets to adjacent heat sources, and industry best practice to complete the impacity analysis. For this project, both the preferred and noticed alternative designs, as we were just discussing, for all routes were developed further to a planning grade plan and profile design. This level of design is completed with the incorporation of quality level B survey, which is obtained using additional subsurface detection equipment like electromagnetic tracing or ground penetrating radar to connect the points located in level C to map the utility lines between the points. 
The survey team is also opening manholes to obtain invert depths of as much infrastructure. I, I'm sorry, is also opening manholes what? To obtain invert, invert depths of as much infrastructure as possible and to identify the pitch of gravity infrastructure. I'd just like to highlight again that we're using survey data only to develop our designs. We do not use GIS data to develop any designs. It can be used as a general reference or resource, but it will not be used to develop our plan and profile designs. At this stage in design, manhole locations are adjusted following the completion of updated pulling tension and sidewall pressure calculations, incorporating the revised plan and profile data. As previously discussed, we look to limit bending radii to 50 feet to minimize the risk that we will have pulling tension or sidewall pressure issues. But thorough calculations for each termination to manhole and manhole to manhole segment are required to ensure that the vaults are spaced appropriately. This assessment cannot be done by assuming lengths without any regard for the path between them. As we develop the plan and profile designs, we are recalculating opacities, accounting for the updated profiles and offsets to adjacent heat sources to ensure that as the design gets refined, that we can still meet the identified current rating requirements for each transmission line. All of this is just speaking to the technical aspects of design development throughout. We are also working with third party stakeholders, including many utilities and municipalities to develop our designs. This is the level of design development that the company completed to feed the development of the lines assessed within the petition to ensure that they're reliable, which stands in stark contrast to the high level review completed by WSP. Thank you, Ms. Klein. And um, just to follow up on an issue that was uh, the topic of rec request, rec request MIT2 um, posed by Mr. Dottori. Can you comment on how Eversource's plan and profile drawings for uh, particular routes compare with the drawings provided by WSP with respect to their proposed alternative routes? We're at plan and profile stage to inform a plus or minus 25% cost estimate for the design of the company's proposed routes. WSP is barely at the universe of routes level. WSP refers to its alignment as high level and a schematic in their own words. And evidently it was developed over a short one to two month period after they were engaged by MIT. On the other hand, the company's proposed routes were developed by a team of experts with background and experience in engineering, construction, environmental, and routing. And after an unprecedented stakeholder engagement process over a three year period. To get into more details, there's a material difference in analysis between the WSP proposed routes and Eversource's design for its proposed routes. It's hard to compare a line on a page. I, I, I'm sorry, I, I'm sorry. If I didn't it's, proposed hard, routes. it's hard to compare a line on a page versus the company's fully developed plan and profile design utilizing quality level B survey. As an example, as outlined in my testimony earlier today, the company completes a robust review of the design to identify manhole locations. Refining the designs as an additional, refining the designs, excuse me, as additional survey information is acquired and taking into account all concerns regarding pulling tension and sidewall pressures between each splice and termination point. WSP testified to the fact that they basically extrapolated general distances between vaults from the company's proposed designs without any regard for the path between them. And while they expressed that proposing that the transmission line stay at a common depth deeper than is required for the full length of the installation, that would be enough to minimize tensions to disregard any issues with the length between the splice vaults. I'd note that the overall tension reduction would be negligible. It would not be a factor in allowing us to eliminate required vaults or to extend the distance between them. The bigger picture is the additional costs and extended time frame of constructing at a greater depth unnecessarily. Greater depth comes with slower construction process, progress, longer impact on abutters, additional dewatering concerns, 
and additional required support of utilities. In pro providing approximate locations for manholes, they also did not account for the proposed tight turn onto Mass Ave from Albany Street that would likely require an additional set of vaults. Further, WSP also noted that they believed we would only need one set of vaults along the Grand Junction North Corridor, but this segment of the alignment is 4,000 feet long, and there would need to be at least two sets of vaults along this corridor to complete the cable installation. Beyond manhole locations, I'd also note that any numeric comparisons, for example, 517 versus 114 for crossings, or 30 versus two for required relocations, et cetera, between the proposed Eversource and MIT routes are hollow comparisons because the quality of the designs are not equivalent. And this difference in design and understanding also applies to the MIT cost comparisons where WSP is using multipliers of its preliminary routing plan to account for general challenges in place of an actual planning grade design inclusive of all the details the company has accounted for in developing its cost estimates. Thank you, Ms. Klein. I wonder if you also have some commentary regarding the testimony of um, WSP witnesses regarding their alignment for both Grand Junction North to Albany Street, that segment in the Wadsworth Street segment. As previously stated, that testimony made clear that WSP's proposal is fraught with inconsistencies, lack of detail, generalities, and misconceptions, which should relegate it to being a not serious proposal. For example, they say in their direct testimony on page five of MIT-WSP-1 that an alignment between Pacific Street and Main Street would pose serious constructability challenges and include the presence of MIT steam lines in eliminating the Grand Junction North alternative. Yet their own proposed route along Grand Junction North to Albany Street includes a significant stretch between Pacific Street and Mass Ave, which is within the overall reference stretch from Pacific to Maine that has the same constraints. They also did not understand the function and utility of fluidized thermal backfill and its impact on circuit ampacity. The fluidized thermal backfill is a thermal conductor. It's an engineered backfill to allow the heat to more easily flow from the transmission line. As the company typically utilizes the fluidized thermal backfill, it is installed on top of the thermal concrete encased duct bank to allow for a path for the heat to dissipate as if through a chimney with the understanding and expectation that the native soil around it likely has more insulating properties and it would be harder for the heat to dissipate through that native material. WSP is proposing to install a layer of fluidized thermal backfill between the two duct banks they first proposed to stack and then proposed to install side by side for the proposed Broadway to Wadsworth alternative. This would mean adding a thermal conductor between the two duct banks, which will allow the heat to flow easier between the duct banks and could actually feed the mutual heating between the two duct banks, making the issue worse. Particularly for the circuits carried by P13, this could mean an increase in cable size or require a change in the design to two cables per phase. What they're proposing makes sense from a civil perspective, but completely disregards the electrical implications. Further, regarding the Wadsworth uh, proposed alignment, I note that they have no expertise to evaluate the dual duct bank alignment that they're proposing in Wadsworth Street. That design reflects a basic misunderstanding of what is a reliable transmission line and is clearly an inferior design. As previously discussed and as outlined in the analysis, at a minimum, we are looking to obtain 10 feet geographic separation between duct banks to avoid the risk that one event could take out circuits feeding multiple stations around the system. Regardless of whether the duct banks are stacked as initially proposed by WSP or configured side by side in a vertical configuration as proposed in their SIR rebuttal, this does not alleviate the reliability concern introduced by either proposal. They testified the need for multiple trenches crossings along the MIT proposed routes. However, WSP's response to EFSB, MIT-12 parens 1 
does not include all of the trenchless crossings they recognized as being needed for their routes, including the trenchless crossing required to cross the Red Line Tunnel and the Grand Junction Railroad tracks at Main Street and Albany Street. And they also don't identify the need for a trenchless crossing underneath the Red Line to route onto Wadsworth Street as the shallow depth of the tunnel where Wadsworth intersects Main Street would require it. And again, I just stress that WSP's witnesses acknowledge that their proposal is just a quote schematic and nowhere close to the developed plan and profile level of understanding that Eversource has with its proposed routes. Just one more question for you, Ms. Klein. Um, and this pertains to how the company would intend to cross the MBTA red line onto Vassar Street. Um, how would that be done? And I want you to kind of compare it to what WSP described in their testimony. Test pitting completed by the company has confirmed that the red line tunnel is at a depth at the crossing location on Vassar Street, as well as the crossing locations on Ames Street that will allow the company to install the duck banks for B29, P13, and B2A over the red line tunnel for all of the company's proposed alignments. As previously outlined in earlier testimony, WSP's proposal for the B29 route would require a complicated trenchless crossing of both the red line tunnel and the Grand Junction railroad tracks. The need for this crossing was identified by WSP in their own testimony. To achieve WSP's proposed installation from Broadway to Wadsworth, a trenchless crossing of the Red Line Tunnel will also be required, as previously discussed. Locating an entry and exit pit for both of these crossings is going to be extremely challenging. And from initial review, the company does not see how they would not impact both Grand Junction Park at the corner of Galilee Way and Main Street for the proposed B29 crossing and Galaxy Park for the proposed B2A and P13 crossing. The company's proposal to open cut above the red line to cross it on Vassar Street and Ames Street will constitute much less challenging and shorter installations than what WSP is proposing. And I'd close by noting that the company's assessment of the red line tunnel and how it factored into the routing analysis and selection is outlined in the analysis on pages 4-20 and 4-21. Thank you, Ms. Klein. Mr. Abdul, before we kind of transition off of this, do you have anything to add to the testimony that Ms. Klein provided? Wow. Um, so that was very thorough. <laughs> I, just, I just needed to speak to that because the energy is inside. But um, if, if I were going to add anything just from the standpoint of um, the reliability question um, that was posed to the uh, WSP witnesses and the response around it being underground, the infrastructure being underground. So like, it was inherently a reliable installation. I would, you know, similar to uh, Ms. Klein's testimony, like echo the fact that, you know, the lens is civil from that standpoint, because like everything she just spoke to, um, like everything Ms. Klein just spoke to was about creating an environment where the cable could thrive. And so like, if I were gonna add anything, it would just be about the measures the company has taken to develop and design a, um, a cable, you know, construction that, that, that could um, be reliable, like, like in the space. And, you know, for, for example, we're, we're looking to, design a cable that in the duct bank system, you know, can withstand the, you know, the inherent operational transients, the uh, um, um, maybe lightning strikes, uh, um, you know, various um, surges during the operating life. And that happens in the pre-qualification testing of the conductor. That happens in the um, choice of who, the manufacturer is that we're choosing to provide the cable. Um, that was a very rigorous process, you know, starting out with about nine manufacturers. And I believe this is something that the company is um, leading the way on in North America as far as developing our own design as opposed to allowing the manufacturer to have a competitive edge in the space 
trying to get more out of less from a, a material standpoint where they understand the voltage stresses and they're trying to to reduce the insulating wall we we developed our own design and filtered that list of eight or nine manufacturers down to about four or five that had the actual tooling had a, a vertical extrusion tower that could create an environment where the concentricity was more consistent rather than an often used cantilevered system where they would utilize water to create the buoyancy to allow for the concentricity to be maintained while also introducing the water that would need to be heated up and you know burned away in the manufacturing process um and also going to you know take factory tours in South Korea in you know uh in Italy in North Carolina to you know really vet the manufacturing process pre-qualify factories etc so you know these are the steps to to improve the reliability of the conductor that come way before when it's time to install the conductor in the well-designed, uh, uh, um, very detailed uh, um, uh, duct bank that this client spoke to. So those are those are just some some more, you know, um, um, things that we do take into account as a company to deliver a reliable product. The everything this client spoke to was really about the environment that we would be putting um, this product into, and you know the the design, the reliability that we're talking about is the cycle life. It is the forty year horizon, and so the testing is intended to model um, the pre qualification testing to get to the conductor is intended to model the uh, the events, the wear and tear, quote unquote wear and tear the cable would experience over its 40 years of life. Um, so there, there's a lot more that goes into it than putting a duct bank underground and um, transposing the alignment kind of, you know, based on, uh, you know, what WSP has seen on the page from, from, from our design. Thank you, Mr. Abdul and Ms. Klein. We do have further um, examination, more limited with uh, our witnesses, but I will sort of Reserve that um, to allow staff and other uh, parties to conduct any examination that they may have on the topics we just addressed. So I appreciate uh, the the flexibility and allow us to get this uh, testimony in at this time. Thank you. Well, Mr. Rosenzweig, while I appreciate that you are trying to accommodate Ms. Klein's schedule, it seems as if we have segued from perhaps doing cleanup to moving on to the company's rebuttal of the company's MIT of, of MIT's witnesses. So what I'd like to do right now is to go off the record and have a discussion with counsel, including MIT as to um, how we might address that as part of the, our scheduling for the rest of the hearings. Off the record. Mr. M, uh, Mr. Dutore, since this perhaps more directly affects you, um, do you have any comment you'd like to make in terms of uh, either your follow-up to the company's presentation of Ms. Klein's testimony or um, other issues potentially related to rebuttal and sur rebuttal and uh, as part of our scheduling. Right. Well, I, it seemed pretty clear that, I mean, it seemed like Ms. Klein was, was reading into the record something that had been previously prepared. Um, so I, I'd like the opportunity, if there's going to be another hearing day anyway, I'd like the opportunity to examine, uh, potentially examine her on that at the next hearing day. I mean, there's a lot of really new information coming in and there's, she's leaving in, I don't know what, 34 minutes. I don't really think I could develop a reasonable cross-examination. I may not be able to do it anyway, but I certainly couldn't do it in 34 minutes. 
Well, I, I also think probably it would be more efficient in terms of following up on the redirect that the company just did of Ms. Klein um, for both for the staff as well to take some additional time um, to follow up on what she's presented today. So my expectation would be um, that we would address any questions of her on what she's stated today um, in the last section of her testimony at future hearings. Mr. Rosenzweig. Yeah, um, I mean, overall, I, I don't have a problem with that approach. Uh, and I would say that her testimony here was a mix of redirect responding to some of the questions that came up during John's examination and, and, and to be fair, um, rounding out some points that had been previously discussed um, in uh, both in their testimony, but further addressed in Sir rebuttal that came in sort of during the process. So it's a mix and we intend to make her and others available to address that, whatever questions uh, the staff has or Mr. DeTore. Um, I'm just trying to find a date. Uh, we'll, we'll sort of accommodate schedules as best we can as, um, to do, to allow that to occur. I understand. And I know the um, rebuttal and sur rebuttal and updates and supplements have been uh, kind of an ongoing target um, as we've moved throughout the the last couple of weeks of this proceeding. So um, I'm just trying to figure out how to how to deal with it in terms of the schedule. That's all. Well, I think Ali's available on the 13th. I, I don't know about other witnesses and Mr. Abdullah, maybe you can comment um, if you're available on the 13th. Uh, still getting an inventory of availability from other company witnesses on the 13th, but I think so far that's looking good. Um, and, and, we... and, and I think probably also days after, for example, okay. days after the 14th, you may wish to consider witnesses availability for that time period as well. Okay, we'll do that. Yes, yes I'm available. Thank you, Jermaine. Okay, um, I know we're off the record, but um, let's take our, let's take a 15 minute break right now and come back at quarter 12. Um, could I could I just ask, Miss Andy? Do you have questions to follow up? Is, is that why you were on? I do have one question, and I don't want to lose the chance to ask it before the thirteenth, if that would be possible. I think it'll be a relatively brief exchange. That's fine, Mr. Green. Let's go back on the record then. Thank you. Um, good morning, Miss Klein. Good morning. So I think your your testimony was uh, quite clear um, just now, but I do want to ask you a pointed question about timing. Um, you've obviously pointed out your perception of of um, um, flaws, if you will, or less than optimal characteristics of the WSP proposal for routing the transmission lines in the area of MIT. But I, I, I'd like to get your Point of view on whether um, timing would have mattered in your response. If, if MIT had brought forward these exact same routing proposals in 2020, when I believe the testimony is that Eversource uh, first engaged with MIT and others on routing design, do you think your response would have differed in any appreciable manner? Well, I'd probably have to defer others on my team who were involved in the routing analysis because I believe and we've identified that these routes were eliminated during that process for reasons in addition to the concerns that we have as far as the routing that have been brought forward. Um, so I don't know if Ms. Benjamins or anyone else on the team can speak to that. 
Uh, I can, Mr. Green, if you would like me to right now. Sure. Um, I do think that there are a number of opportunities that we could have dug in deeper on some of those routes. We were charged with making decisions with the information that was um, available to us at the time. Um, and I still think, as Ms. Klein stated, there's some issues that still have not been resolved. Um, for example, the city of Cambridge's uh, position on use of some streets. Um, I think we there may have been an opportunity to vet the Grand Junction corridor further. We did vet it considerably and there are challenges that we would have faced. Um, but I do think that timing is of the essence when we're having these conversations and having, um, in our opinion, a free flow of dialogue and exchange of information, requesting feedback. Um, we felt that it was a productive partnership that we were building and looking at these routes. So again, um, on the particular question, do you think the, the conclusions on the preferred routing um, that the company has put forward would have changed if it had taken a, you know, a sort of more intensive view or review of the MIT proposal three years ago, let's say. I do not believe our position would change. We would still be um, proposing these same routes. And Mr. And, Green, if I could, I'm sorry, please finish your thought. I was just going to give Ms. Klein an opportunity to also put her point of view on the on the record. But Ms. Mr. Howard, happy to hear yours as well. Yeah, my position is the same as what I testified to earlier in the proceedings. Um, we would have, in my opinion, we would have reached the same conclusion that we've reached today. It's just reaffirmed what we were working with back then, what we knew then. Um, <clears throat> there are sections of the petition where you may recall, Mr. Green, where I walked the setting board staff through those characteristics of routes where we sought to avoid and minimize interactions with those characteristics and the routes proposed by MIT in the variations uh, hit many of those characteristics and they were screened out appropriately appropriately at that time. I have heard nothing that changes my opinion. I think they were properly screened out then and I would continue to screen them out today. And from a technical yeah. perspective, I know you were looking uh, to get my input as well. I would agree that we, there's nothing that we've seen as we've kind of dug deeper into these proposed routes during this, these proceedings that would make us believe that these were more constructible or more easily constructible. There are construction and installation and reliability challenges with what MIT is proposing that are that make our routes clearly superior to their proposed routes. So whether that would have been brought out during the routing analysis or during more detailed technical review, I would agree with Mr. Howard and Ms. Benjamins that our assessment would remain the same. Okay, um, so again, just to get it clearly stated on the record, Eversource's perspective on the MIT routes is not um, diminished by the fact that they are coming up now rather than perhaps um, the possibility that they would have been presented earlier. That, that's really not a factor in where the company is is uh, sort of making its conclusions. That is correct. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Ms. Strachey, I think it seems like we're gonna lose Ms. Klein right, right after the break. I have one quick question to follow up if that's okay. Go ahead, Mr. Wong. Sorry about that. Um, so Ms. Klein, you talked about three different levels of, of um, design, level D up to, to B. I believe you had stated that the notice alternative and the the company's preferred route is up to level B. Is that correct? That's correct. And when I speak about the levels, that's actually the quality level of the survey that we use to feed those different levels of design, just to clarify. Okay. And level B is is the, the level of, of survey that's able to inform planning grade, plan, planning grade design. Is that correct? That's correct. It allows us to develop both the plan and the profile design. Thank you. And if I could extrapolate, do you, do you see that the level of detail 
of data that WSP has used would be level D or is that below level D? I would say it's hard to characterize it in full because they seem to have compiled data from different sources, um, including some data that were acquired from other projects in the area, as well as just some GIS data, which as I noted, we do not utilize for design. So I would, as a, on a whole, I would say that it was it's below quality level D survey. We do not use GIS data and we'd be looking to complete an actual design of these proposed routes to get full complete updated survey from start to end point. Okay. Um, and, and sorry, go ahead. Mr. Wong, just, uh, just while you're on that question, because I think this is important and it's come up in a few of the discussions um, over the past several hearings, just to be clear for the, for the routes that we scored, the candidate routes, and many routes that we didn't score, it was all level D survey. It was an apples to apples comparison between all those different candidate routes. There was no mixing of data. There was no mishmash of GIS and weaving this into that. It was consistently applied to all the routes for all the candidate routes that we scored. Thank you. Thank you. And so final clarification on the, the timing would be, um, so for I, from my understand, the level D seem to be more gathering what, what's out there in terms of what existing data and level C was actual field surveys. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. In terms of timing, when did the company conduct its level C surveys for its own um, route, routing uh, options? Off the top of my head, I don't know. I don't know, Mr. Eck, if that's information that you have offhand. <laughs> I'm 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 laughing for a reason because of memory here. Um it would have I believe the surveys would have been performed and this is subject to check um probably in 2021 with regards to the 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 routes that were being engineered. Thank you. So um, on promise is the last question. Um, so so I believe Ms. Benjamins, you had testified to on Wednesday in response to, to MIT's questions that the if the company were to go with MIT's routes, that would add one or two years further in terms of design. Does the fact that the the um, notice alternative design is is up to a planning grade mean that that additional one to two years would not be a factor? Um, I'm so, not sure I'm following because the notice alternative doesn't overlap MIT's routes. No, so I, what I'm saying is that if, and I understand Mr. Eck, you had said that you've, you've been doing more surveys for the preferred route. What I'm saying is that if the company were to not build either route, but the notice alternative route, if there would be those those s same delays in terms of one or two years of additional uh, engineering required. No. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mr. Ack. Uh, thanks, Ms. Benjamin. So as as noted, we've been advancing our conversations with with all parties, you know, the city and MBTA, MassDOT, uh, with with focused on our preferred routes. So um, any additional surveys and discussions would need to reinitiate with regards to the noticed alternative route. And so there are there are additional times and timelines involved with that. Um, now those routes are already introduced into our petition. So the timelines, involved with heading down the the noticed alternative routes if we if those were the routes that were slated to be approved would be solely focused on advancing the designs and and starting to coordinate the construction there would be a direct impact if that decision was made on the overall in service date for this project uh, now because 
the information of those routes is within the petition, there wouldn't be an apples to apples delay with, you know, when trying to compare against the MIT routes, the MIT routes were basically starting kind of back to square one and obtaining the surveys, performing the engineering, and there's levels of engineering where you would then go back and do additional surveys to get us to the same point that we are engineering wise that we could then present the, the MIT routes in a way to the siting board that we would feel comfortable saying is constructible. We're not there yet. That could potentially, again, when we talk about obtaining surveys, each level of survey, whether it's level C or level B, when we reach those stages, those typically take about three or four months. And that's not in areas where we may need permits from um, DCR, MassDOT, MBTA, we're sometimes just getting the access permits to perform the test pits and the geotech work can take four to six months. And in this project, sometimes we're, we're actually still waiting for permits and it's been well beyond that six month time frame. So we would have a lot to perform. Let's, you know, I'm just gonna say it'd probably take us close to a year to get the engineering. And again, Ms. Klein can, can speak in more details to that, but we would get about a year to get the engineering design in a place and get the cost estimates associated with that to be able to present that back to the board, in which case then we would have to go through, and this is out of my realm, but then we'd have to go through the proceedings and 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 the timelines associated with the, the modified petition. So, Mr. Eck, were you referring to the noticed alternative in your response or the MIT routes? I started out with the noticed alternative, okay. where we're, <laughs> and I migrated to the MIT routes. But okay, I was, so, what I was, go ahead. Ms. Yes, the so Mr. Wang, um, Mr. Eck was laying out what it would take to uh, the year that would play into the MIT routes. Uh, we'd have to go back and look at the timing. There would be additional time, and Mr. Eck is correct, that it would delay the in-service date to undertake the additional surveys and engineering of the notice alternative route. We would also have to re-engage with each of the stakeholders about our intent to change our preferred route and um, ensure we are engaged fully on all of those um, requests of the City of Cambridge and others. Thank you. Um, You're welcome. I don't have anything further on this topic. Um, Ms. Benjamins, I might come back and ask you if, if you could give that um, that additional timing thing, but I'll, I'll have to think, I'll, I'll still want it over the break if that's okay. Okay, happy to help. <laughs> Thank you. So does anyone have anything else that they need to ask Ms. Klein before she leaves for the day? Um, with the understanding that she will be returning and there will be an opportunity for further questioning on the testimony she presented today, as well as the testimony that she's presented earlier in these proceedings. Okay, thank you, Ms. Klein. Thank you. I appreciate the consideration of my shortened time frame. So it's now um, quarter of 12. I believe we have additional questions for the rest of the company's witnesses. Is that correct, Mr. Wong? Yes, I think there are two questions. In total? Let me check. Um, yes. Um, Mr. Dottori, do you have an estimate? I'm, well, I'm just trying to gauge, sure. um, uh, you know, uh, when to take the lunch break, how much more we have to do today. So any help anybody can give sure. me on that particular topic, I'd appreciate. Well, the only, the only potential questions that I, I have would be on, 
on Ms. Klein's testimonial. So, and we're talking about doing that on the 13th. So I wouldn't expect, in fact, my preference would be not to go forward today with any questioning of the company's witnesses and, and do it all on the 13th. Okay. In that case, um, why don't we um, resume with the questions that the staff has for the company's witnesses? And then uh, we will break for the day. And mm -hmm. I believe people will provide me with information on their availability for future hearing days. Ms. Starkey, um, I, I think Mr. Rosenzweig had more redirect. Is that correct? I did. It, it, it would be shorter, but if there was some additional um, uh, direct, additional examination, excuse me, for the other company witnesses, it may be more efficient given everyone else deferring the questioning until the 13th to do it on the 13th or, or whatever subsequent day is scheduled, but I, I, I could do it now. Um, no, so. I, you know, if you're comfortable with that, it's probably cleaner well, to wait. Yeah. Unless Mr. DeTore, you want to weigh in. Well, that's, I mean, to the, to the extent, I don't want to get into this continuing loop if there's a lot of new additional information. I'm not, I'm not looking to extend the hearings. My suggestion would be if the company has testimony that's prepared and they're ready to go forward today, it makes sense to get that on the record today. And then I could cover, I mean, we'd be sure to cover everything on the 13th. We wouldn't have any issue about having to go beyond the 13th, at least from MIT's perspective. Okay, then Mr. Wong, would you like to ask your questions then Mr. Rosenzweig will ask his additional questions, and then we will break for the day. Thank you. Sorry for complicating it. Okay. Um, I, can we go off the record for a second? Yeah. Off the record, Alan. I'm sorry you got lost in the um, back is, and forth. How much time are we talking about? If, if I'd like a morning break if we're going to go more than 15 minutes. David, that that makes sense. Let's let's. I think it's going to be ten or fifteen minutes on our end, um, or, or 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 less. But I probably want to adjust some of the questioning, uh, based on trying to sort of not plow old ground that's been touched upon already. So, I we could probably use the break and then be in a position to do that more limited redirect um, after the break and after, well after Mr. Wong's questioning as well. Okay, Mr. Wong, would you like the break before? Let's do it before. Okay. All right, let's come back at um, five after 12. Thank you. Thanks, Alan.
Donna, can you hear me? I, I had to reboot yeah. my computer and I, I wasn't sure if things were working now. I can hear and see you, so thank, thank you should be good to go. Okay, let's go back on the record. Mr. Wang, I believe you had some more questions to resume with. Helen, are you okay to start? Thank you. Okay, um, so I had two two uh, cleanup questions, and then I actually do have one more. Apologize, Mr. Arkey, but um, okay. so we're not we're not keeping count. That's fine, Mr. Wong. Okay, so um, I think I'll do what was top of mind first, um, Mr. Howard, and I apologize. You know, Ms. Klein's not here, but I believe you had said something earlier about an apples to apples um, data comparison for everything that you have done for the company's noticed alternative and preferred routes. Is that correct? I use the term apples to apples comparison with regards to how we scored all the candidate routes, including the company's preferred alternative and noticed alternative. Okay. Um, so I'm just looking at the real time transcript and I guess in that same area, in that same part of the transcript, you talk about no mixing of data. So you said, quote, there was no mishmash of GIS and weaving this into that, which you were referring to the level D survey. Um, does that ring a bell with what you recall? The For context, I was referring to the way that MIT's witnesses from WSP described how they compiled their utility data for the purposes of scoring that criterion. Contrast that with the company where we didn't use GIS information from, I'm, I'm not quoting here, Mr. Wong, but they, they, they made reference to different sources. We consistently obtained level D survey for all the candidate routes that we scored. So we had a common set of data for comparison against all those routes. Thank you. So I think my clarification was, if you, if you could indulge us, um, what, the level D survey you're referring to um, is in, in terms of what, what your data sources would have been. Maybe I'll ask my colleague, Chuck, Mr. Eck here to, to weigh in. Um, the surveyor folks at within Eversource and maybe Mr. Eck can elaborate um, a bit further, but level D survey is a typical level of survey that gives a good sense for the amount of utility congestion within the roadway surfaces. You may recall from prior testimony from Ms. Klein and others about kind of just understanding that horizontal viewpoint. That's what you generally obtain from level D survey as the designs are advanced. And again, that's used for scoring purposes at that point in time. As the designs are advanced and the top two routes are identified, you continue to refine the level of survey information to inform the detailed design of those routes. And I'll pause there and see if Mr. Eck has anything to add or any clarity regarding or Mr. Abdullah regarding the different levels of survey. I, I think the only additional point, and, and, and actually it's not additional, I think Mr. Howard covered it, is level D is effectively a desktop exercise. So it's at the point, it, you're really not performing field observations. You're reaching out to the various agencies and the, and the city to get records and uh, compile those records into a uh, into a, a common file that can then be used for you know use and assessment yeah i agree with that yeah that that's where it starts and as Ms. klein had alluded to you're confirming that with field locates of at grade structures once you're at level c so forth and so on so you're the level of survey is kind of dictated by the method of data acquisition, so. Thank you, and uh, thank you all for, for that. I And I appreciate, Mr. Eck, you said that Level D is a desktop um, sort of survey. I guess what wasn't clear to, to, to the team was, would that not include a GIS um, as a data point, or does the company just prefer not to use that? for whatever reason. 
Well, go ahead. Yeah, as far as like as far as sur survey grade, the level of survey is like I said, it's you have a timestamp. So you've surveyed with equipment to locate in the field. You've stored that information in your records. As time goes on, more infrastructure is put in the ground. That record may not include newer infrastructure. So as you locate in the field, you may introduce new, you may see abandoned, et cetera. But the level of survey is from a survey team going out and shooting points to get what's in the field and to develop a design. The difference with that and GIS is there's a bit of a, you know, kind of digital like acquisition from GIS where you're flying around and maybe targeting points, but you're not basing it on a base map from from either city of Cambridge, um, Cambridge City Base, or you know, Nav 88, et cetera, that everybody is on the same playing field as far as what that actual triangulation point is based on, as opposed to spatial recognition by software that might not be survey grade. Thank you. So, so I, yeah. Sorry, Mr. So, Mr. Abdullah, what, how would you classify the stage at which the company would have three dimensional information on not just the routes of existing infrastructure, but also the depths uh, at which they are beneath the roadway? So, Typically, at level B, you will have some depths based on gravity infrastructure. You may pop covers of drainage, storm, uh, sewer, you know, et cetera, get depths. And then understanding that it's gravity infrastructure, you'll have a pitch. So you begin to, to establish your pipe networks, how, how everything is tied from structure to structure, because you're accessing structures through the manholes. What you don't have is things that aren't gravity fed, like gas, like um, distribution electric, like MBTA, you know, and telecom, et cetera. And so from that standpoint, when you do have a crossing in your uh, a duct bank alignment for a transmission line, for instance, that's where to build the level of confidence that we have in the survey data we've acquired to date, meaning level B, strategically will, along the plan and profile alignment, have test pit points where we're looking to confirm the accuracy of that level B survey that goes above and beyond the gravity infrastructure. So that's when we're talking about quality level A, we've strategically located some test pits some geek, some some Z cuts where we're locating the end walls of manholes and a diagonal cut to tie those end walls, geotech data in order to help us to fully design a trenchless installation or understand the structural integrity of soils in the area because we're going down to a certain depth that may inform supportive excavation or dictate the need for a certain wall thickness that may be different or above and beyond what our standard is for a manhole installation. Thank you, Mr. Abdullah. Thank you, Mr. Abdullah. I appreciate um, your your response before. And so just, I'm gonna restate and see if, if my understanding is correct and you can, can you can confirm or, or reject it, but it sounds like for GIS data, um, not only is it a snapshot in time, it, it, it also does not have perhaps the the level of detail that the company would like to have in terms of its its uh, level D uh, survey uh, information is that does that does that sum up sort of what you were talking about? Yeah, I would only add that there's not a static physical point to tie the data to. Right. There's a digital representation of where you are in space and you're attempting to overlay that on real imagery, but it's just not tied to 
a survey grade point to start to establish your three dimensions. Thank you. That 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 actually clarifies a lot. I've I've had to make GIS GIS shapes and and so on, and I I I definitely agree. Um, okay, Mr. Wong, can I, can I just offer one yeah. more point? Because I, I feel like something's getting lost a little bit in this discussion, and that's just with regards to how I was responding to your question from a route scoring perspective. And from a route scoring perspective, consistency is important. If at the beginning of a route scoring exercise, the team said, we're just going to use GIS data, fine. GIS data will be applied to all the routes. Or Mike, we're just gonna count superficial features on the roadway, manhole covers. Great, that's our approach, but that's applied to all the routes. For this project, we said we want to use level D survey, and that's applied to all the routes. The point I'm making now is the comparisons um, that are being made to the routes that we scored are different data sets. It's not that you couldn't do it that way. It'd give you different results, maybe not the level of detail that we would want to get. It does different things. But if that approach is consistently applied across all the routes, that's one of the key tenets of a routing process. It's that consistency with the data set. Thank you, Mr. Howard. Thank I you. appreciate the clarification. Okay, um, so moving on to my other questions. Um, so on the first day of hearings, we briefly talked about project costs, and and you know I think um, one of my colleagues asked about, you know, generally it seems like uh, project costs have been escalating in the past couple of years. Um, could I get a further record, just on the record of a a concise description of what um, is in your in the company's opinion is contributing to these increased uh, project costs? And also, would the company expect the costs to come down in the future? I can so, begin we'll answering go. that question and then um, have Mr. Ak chime in. Uh, I have, we've seen an evolution over the last decade of underground infrastructure projects and what they take to bring to fruition. Um, certainly, there's been a pretty significant um, change in procurement and supply, which has driven up costs that we've seen across the board. Um, I also think as a company, we've been refining how we do cost estimating for underground projects and are taking experience in the field and applying that directly to these projects. Um, so we have a much more clear idea of what it's going to take for these projects to be successful now than we did, say, you know, eight to 10 years ago. Um, Chuck, why don't you go into some details and I can add. <laughs> Thanks, Ms. Benjamin. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to rethink about the, the question that was, was being asked. You're asking about our determination of, of, of what we're seeing in terms of trends, of, in terms of increases in costs. And I, I think at the core of everything, uh, and it was mentioned previously, is, is schedule. So in general, everything being the same, there's escalation in an upward fashion, right? So every day that the schedule pushes out is another day of escalation. And that doesn't change. You know, at a high level, that's a simplistic way to look at it. But Overall, if if the schedules are shifting out, then you anticipate the escalation of the project to go up. In terms of the general environment in which we're at and materials and labor, uh, as mentioned in previous testimony, we do have a cost estimating group within Eversource that keeps, um, you know, at a bare minimum monthly updates and assessments and are in close coordination with contractors and vendors about trends that they're seeing and looking back I, I believe they look back over the course of the past year or two just to get an idea of the trends of escalation and those trends are incorporated into our cost estimates but um, 
until we have a, a confirmed schedule. Um, it's at that point that uh, we'll, we'll know what our true costs are going to be. So I think just just rounding that out, um, it would be nice if costs would go down and <laughs> our procurement team and our um, construction teams, as I think Mr. Abdul Abdullah mentioned, we're constantly looking for the most cost effective way to proceed um, by, in some cases, we've been combining multiple projects into contracts, like when we're procuring conductor um, to get the best quantity. Um, in many cases, we're looking at different strategies for how we contract out projects to get the most cost-effective way moving forward. Um, there's also the issue of mitigation where um, we're really working to balance what the mitigation is that's being asked of us for these projects versus what um, the cities or whoever the owner is of that land is looking for. But that is a piece that needs to be factored in. And as we progress, um, has become more and more challenging for us. Um, so I think um, we're working on trying to make sure that we meet the time frame of projects at the best possible cost. And I'm hoping, I think we're all hoping that is um, hopefully inflation changes <laughs> that we'll see a reduction in costs in the future, but I, I can't promise that. Thank you. I appreciate both your responses and also Ms. Benjamin's trying to, to tie up the second part of the question. Yeah. Um, and I, I definitely think inflation has been something brought up. Also, you, you brought up changes in the procurement um, and of projects and also the supply chain issues. And do, do you also see that? I mean, this might not be fair to, to ask you because you're not an economist, maybe, but like, do you also... <laughs> Is that also something that you hope could could sort itself out and costs would normalize again? Or do you see that as something that's going to keep escalating in the future? I can tell you our procurement teams have been seeing costs continue to go up and the time frames for procuring materials continuing to increase. Um, I, I, I can't answer into the future. Um, I can just tell you the trends that have been communicated to us. Thank you. And and to tie that back to Mr. X statement about scheduling, I, I guess it's not, it's fair to say that any delay in this project would not result in decrease in cost. They'd rather ca cause increases. Is that correct? That's correct. When you're looking at a project cost, you have the component, which is the AFUDC, and that's basically how much is it costing for us to borrow the money in a very simple way to build the project so the longer the project takes to come into service the higher those dollar amounts become um, and it's directly tied to when the project goes into service could you spell out afudc I was afraid you were going to ask that. I <laughs> it's allowance. It's allowance for funds used during used. construction. Correct, Ms. Sharkey. <laughs> Sharkey. <laughs> okay. Um, I have one more question not related to costs. Um, so um, could I refer the company to your um, analysis at page 4-25, please? And this has to do with um, public shade trees and and heat island effect. And let me know when you are ready to answer. I see it. Chris, you see page 4-25? I do, and I've read it, yes. Thank you. So the company I believe is here is describing um, public shade trees as a, a factor that it used in, in, um, in selecting routes. Is that correct? It was 
what are the criteria that we use in the route selection process, correct? Thank you. So um, here the company connects the public shade tree, number of public shade trees to heat island effect. Um, I was wondering if, I don't believe I saw them, but if, if they are, I was wondering if there are other references to heat island effect in the record besides this, this sentence connecting it to a criteria that you use for selecting routes. To my knowledge, Mr. Wong, there are no other references. The intent of that write-up was to articulate to the setting board um, the potential importance of that criterion in this study area. Thank you. So, Mr. Mr. Howard, could you please just explain for the benefit of the record what the concept of a heat island effect is and how um, trees within urban areas can be seen as relieving the heat island effects, I would appreciate it. Right. And so in very general terms, um, not in all urban areas and not in every portion of an urban area, um, mature trees can provide an oasis for the residents and visitors of those communities. Um, and where there are opportunities to preserve those trees, to provide that sort of relief, including temperature cooling and shading and green space and recreational aspects, um, where they're more valuable in those types of communities. Um, we identified that as an important consideration and we incorporated that as a specific criterion in our routing analysis. Now, again, with all the criterion, um, doesn't mean we'll be able to avoid any shade tree removals, but we understood the importance of it. We weighted it that way. And wherever possible, our goal is to avoid and minimize impacts to that resource. Um, I can add to what Mr. Howard said in relation to the heat island effect that you're questioning. Um, what we see in many urban areas and is studied um, by other entities other than myself is that because of the placement of pavement, sidewalks, infrastructure, you have a reflection of heat and a creation of heat. That means that cities and other urban areas create somewhat of a heat island. And there are various ways that a city or urban area can work to reduce that heating of an urban area with the use of trees or um, other green infrastructure. Like in the city of Cambridge, the city of Boston and Somerville, you see a lot of the rooftop gardens, which serve for like public green spaces, but they also reduce the heating of the cities. So it's something that um, several cities have brought up in our conversations with them of how do we build infrastructure so that we're not contributing to those heat islands? Um, and is there a way that we can reduce that heat? Does that answer your question? That's helpful, Ms. Benjamins. Um, could you also comment on whether the city of Cambridge, the city of Boston, and the city of Somerville have policies with regard to maintaining existing shade trees and potentially expanding um, the propagation of additional trees within the urban landscape um, in part to, ad to address the issue of heat islanding? I, I can address it in two parts. Um, and I would like my colleagues, Mr. Newhall and Mr. Howard, to also help with answering this question. Each of the cities has their own specific requirements for not only shade trees, but trees in general, because they play such an important part in um, the environment that we're seeing, not just from a, um, a heating perspective. In each of the cities, if you are if you do need to remove a tree, it needs to be replaced in kind with some level of mitigation. Um, in the case of this project, 
we've had to, in some cases, base our design on um, avoiding specific trees. Um, so I'm hoping that my colleague, Mr. Howard, can speak more to the specific tree requirements. I think that's a fairly good summary, um, Ms. Benjamins. Um, each of the communities has their, well, I shouldn't, let me, let me qualify that. Certainly with regards to Cambridge, Masharki, they have ordinances that prescribe or regulatory processes that prescribe the steps that an applicant would go through to seek permission to remove a tree and then mitigate the unavoidable impacts from that tree. Um, I have to imagine Somerville and Boston do as well. In fact, I'm fairly certain they do, Masharki. My colleague, Chris Newhall, shaking his head. Um, the only other comment I would make, and if you just give me a second, I want to point you to a section of the petition. So on page 5-76 of the petition, this is the analysis, um, and this is in the Putnam study area, but the analysis that's described there applies to shade tree considerations in all the study areas. On that page of the analysis, we talk about the approach that we will go through to avoid and minimize these impacts, starting with, uh, you know, obviously finalizing our design to try and avoid such impacts, meeting with the local tree wardens. Uh, if we're near a tree, we have measures in there that we will undertake to avoid impacts to that tree. Um, there's language in here regarding fencing and setbacks, uh, unique pruning aspects to minimize impacts and so forth. And then at the top of page 5-77, the last bullet, we talk about where we encounter unavoidable impacts to those shade trees. We will work with the local municipalities to come up with a mitigation plan that's acceptable to them um, to provide those replacement plantings. So is it fair to say, Mr. Howard, that in addition to considering the existing trees as a factor in scoring different routes, that the company also has discussions with the municipalities in terms of the post-construction um, restoration of roads and areas impacted by the construction um, with regard to potential replanting or additional plantings being made to address those concerns? Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Sorry, Mr. Wong. I am, I, I guess one, one follow-up. I, I think Ms. Sharkey asked about existing, um, existing policies that, that the cities might've had. Um, Ms. Ms. Benjamins, you had stated that several cities in your conversations, not with, with regard to this project necessarily, have raised concerns about heat island effect. Can, yeah. you, can you tell us if in this particular project that's been a concern raised? That's a good question. I, I think it's come up in the sense of more along the lines of green space with the projects and how the substation being underground is allowing for more recreational and green space for the communities to utilize. Um, the conversations that I specifically recall are in relation um, in the city of Somerville and how they would like to address their heat islands when we're looking at future substations. Okay. Um, Ms. Sharkey, I'm all set. Okay, um, I do have one question I'd like the company to address with regard to its most recent information provided in its response to EFSB RS 19 parens S2, which is some updated cost information. Um, and I believe that's the estimate of costs associated with the 
most recent proposed hybrid route. Is that correct, Mr. Rosenzweig? That's correct. It's the updated cost estimate for what we call Route S15, which is the noticed hybrid alternative route as it was originally referred to. Um, I'd like to ask the witnesses if those updated cost components reflect any of the cost of undergrounding um, infrastructure in the city of Somerville that are related to the additional undergrounding requirements that the city of Somerville has requested. Are you asking, does that cost in include the mitigation to underground the distribution line? That's right, because they talked about both the companies existing above ground distribution lines and potentially other utility infrastructure that are um, carried on poles on which the the company's existing distribution infrastructure is located. Um, the request by the city of Somerville is not directly included. Um, we do carry some level of contingency for understanding of mitigation in those components. So we are working on identifying what the cost and um, capability is for us to meet the city's request. Um, so does the company have an estimate at present of what the additional cost would be associated with complying with the city of Somerville's request? Not at this time. Okay, I'd like to make a record request. Um, record request EFSB-34 for the company to provide that cost estimate associated with the mitigation requested by the city of Somerville and presented in Mr. Postal Waits um, testimony before the board. Okay. Um, we, once available. Okay, good. We are working on it. It is a pretty extensive request, so we'll try to expedite it as much as possible. Thank you, Ms. Benjamins. Thank you. Um, I had one further um, question to ask with regard to um, testimony offered by the city of Somerville at hearing on Wednesday. Um, I believe they were discussing a desire for flexibility for future refinements um, to the route through Somerville for the proposed hybrid route um, that might be available in light of redevelopment plans in that immediate area. Does the company anticipate that based on what it knows now, there will be a need for additional changes to the proposed routing beyond the description that's contained in the, for example, motion for supplemental notice, um, which I believe already talked about maintaining some, a variation that was originally proposed in order to provide some flexibility associated with redevelopment? That's a good question. And the filing that the company has made allows um, for some flexibility, in our opinion, um, as um, Somerville's plans evolve. That is why we included the variations that we did. So put another way, Ms. Sharkey, to the extent where we know of that potential future flexibility, the variation depicted on the map set accommodates that. And hopefully you would believe the risk of, for example, a notice of project change or <laughs> subsequent supplemental uh, re-notice, depending on the timing, would is not contemplated um, currently by the company. 
Understood. Correct. And um, if Somerville were to re- make some sort of request in the future, as things evolve, we would carefully weigh all those components before proceeding. Um, but we remain um, cooperative with the city of Somerville as their development plans change. Thank you, Ms. Benjamins. Welcome. Mr. Rosenzweig, or does anyone else have any additional questions before Mr. Rosenzweig resumes with brief redirect? In that case, I believe the floor is yours. Thank you, Presiding Officer Sharkin. I think some of the additional um, questioning has cut back on what I intend to do, but I do have um, two particular areas that I uh, want to address with the witnesses. Um, Starting, uh, I think, with Mr. Eck and Ms. Benjamin, you may have a piece of this as well. Uh, You were asked questions by Mr. DeTore on Wednesday regarding um, the, I guess it's MIT's belief that the WSP proposed routes would be more uh, less expensive than the Eversource proposed routes. Do you recall that? Yes. I do. Yep. And given the discussion we had earlier today about some of the company's belief in, in terms of the lack of detail um, regarding their estimates uh, in terms of you know, technical details of the alignment. What does that say to you in terms of what the, the their cost estimates are and how credible or reliable they are? I can start answering this and then have Mr. Ak chime in. This really goes to some of the questions that Mr. Wang was asking earlier and um, the cost estimates that we produce. A resource has learned a lot over the last 15 to 20 years as we've um, uh, developed, engineered, cost estimated, and actually constructed underground transmission lines. And um, in my experience, the reason why we go to the level of effort to to design a project to get to a plus or minus 25% cost estimate is because there's so much variability specifically when it comes to um, constructing underground lines. It's directly contingent upon that plan and profile design of how deep you need to go, how much the line needs to move, how much you need to accommodate that underground infrastructure. So Eversource in our experience over time has held a pretty solid line in the sand that we will advance projects to this level of engineering to make sure we have much more certainty in our cost estimates as we're presenting them to the public. And that is why we're so careful in doing the surveys and carrying forward the engineering and having the conversations with the communities so that there are much less variations in cost estimates as we present them to the public. It's our goal to be much more consistent. So that is our biggest concern that in in cases of our own projects, we'll make assumptions about what those costs will be. And until we've advanced the engineering, there could be a lot of changes um, between what we anticipate internally. So Mr. Eck, could you please add to that? Sure. Uh, thanks, Ms. Benjamins. Um, I, I think at the core of it, you know, in cost estimating, you know, the cost estimate itself is only as good as as the inputs used. And uh, what's meant by that is a clear understanding of, of the scope and the complexities of any given infrastructure installation. And, um, you know, from from at least the testimony that, that's been given to date by the WS P folks, it's pretty evident that the design concepts were just that, um, primarily schematic form, not much more than a, a line on a map with the intent to hand it off to another contractor to try and resolve the design issues um, and, and identify any complexities that need to be designed around. So, um, and, and, and beyond that, the witnesses did not appear to 
have a background in transmission line design and not, I shouldn't even say appear, they, they admitted as much that they did not have a background in transmission line design. And, um, and, and it seemed apparent that they lacked a basic understanding of some of the, the key principles of, of transmission line design, uh, as can be seen from their comments about uh, FTB. Um, at best, again, getting back to the cost estimates that, that MIT and WSP provided, I mean, the, these at best are order of magnitude. I would uh, hesitate even claiming that um, in that the, the, you need to fully better understand what your scope of work is in, in key areas such as Main Street. They, they had mentioned, okay, well, it's likely a trenchless crossing of this and that. But as, as and, and they acknowledge that they're anticipating, for example, Main Street, the crossing of the red line, crossing of the Grand Junction corridor would be under using a trenchless crossing. But then you refer to the estimates that were provided in, uh, I believe it was MIT 12, uh, one where they provided their cost estimating breakdown. There's no mention of trenchless crossing, for example, of the MIT proposed route for the the B. Uh, I'm sorry, the um, the Grand Junction North to Albany route. So th there's a disconnect there in terms of they have some high level concepts as to how to approach the designs but those concepts were not even incorporated into the cost estimates and that, and given their background and, and their testimony as to how these were approached, the, 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 how the cost estimates were approached, um, which primarily, if you notice, it was about providing, you know, difficulty factors to the, to the company's proposed routes and, and reduction factors to the, to the MIT proposed routes. Uh, I'd, I'd have a hard time, Providing any other guidance than not, uh, than not giving these cost estimates any uh, serious consideration. Um, I want to expand ahead. on one thing. When we talk about order of magnitude estimates, that's really quant putting a number of um, potential fluctuation in that cost estimate. So an order of magnitude estimate is something where we say potential to decrease by 50%, but a potential to increase by 200%. And that's looking at, because you know so little about the, the, the design and the area that there could be a drastic swing in that cost estimate. And each engineering stage that we go through then goes back to our cost estimating team and that estimate is refined. So the project, the costs that we've brought forward are at that level where we are confident enough that we're, we're um, narrowing that in to say it has the potential to decrease by 25% or to increase by 25%. And then our next stage of engineering and cost estimating gets us to the plus or minus 10%. So that's why we keep referring to what order of magnitude is and where our cost estimate is because that's a level of risk and contingency and potential for that cost to fluctuate. Well, one further question and I think some of the earlier testimony um, discussed a good part of this in terms of what we see as delay that would be associated with trying to advance the MIT proposed routes. But I want you to focus on why delay would be so problematic to the company from, in terms of meeting the identified need and constructing this project in coordination and collaboration with Boston Properties given their construction schedule. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> I was gonna say, do you want to start or do you want to? Make I'll start. Okay. Um, so as we've progressed with projects in urban areas, Eversource has learned and we strongly believe that we are only going to be successful with by pursuing partnerships with cities, private developers, and other entities. Urban environments are densely populated. The streets have a tremendous amount of infrastructure and we're very limited in our opportunities to locate infrastructure, whether it be transmission lines or substations. And that's evident across this project. 
The other thing that I'd like to point to is because it's in an urban environment, there's a tremendous amount of construction happening by other entities that we also need to coordinate with. So it becomes a very dynamic dance of when those projects will be in construction, when our projects will be in construction, and how we can align those components to be successful. So in the case of Boston Properties, they're at a place in their permitting where they've already started construction. They've made commitments to the city of Cambridge of when those developments will be in place. They've also um, made commitments to their share shareholders on how that will play out. Our So our piece of that development fit, is nestled in at a specific time in their development that allows for us to safely construct the substation um, because they need to stand down part of their construction for us to be able to bring in our equipment and materials um, while they also still have to proceed with their construction. So the schedules that we've worked out are tight and we've had to commit to a specific time frame. And if we miss that time frame, we're not only compromising our ability to meet the need of load growth in Cambridge, which is substantial. Um, we are also not able to follow through on not only our commitment with Boston Properties, but also with um, MIT. We have an agreement with Matimco to cross the Volpe property, um, as well as coordinating construction in the city of Boston um, for the Brighton route because there's a large development proposed for there. So having a lack of understanding or ambiguity on when we can actually proceed really limits us in our ability to work through this partnership. Mr. Eck, would you like, can you add to that, please? Um, yeah, thanks, Ms. Benjamin. Um, what, what I would like to offer and, and add to the topic of, of delays is just try to provide a, a, a better understanding or or provide more detail as to what our concerns are when it comes to the critical path for the schedule for the the uh, energization of this project. Uh, the we, we provided a a high level schedule as part of our response to EFSB um, CM three, and when referencing that, you'll notice that we put an assumption of a EFSB approval date of of June. Um, 2024. And uh, based on that, we're reflecting an initial energization date of June of 2029. Now, the critical path, meaning the elements that will drive day for day the, the end energization date of this project is the construction of the substation. And while the start of our efforts on the substation uh, construction may seem it's far out, because we're reflecting in that schedule that we're starting early um, 2027. The lead times of the major equipment that we need to procure that would start being installed that early 2027 range in times from 18 to 30 months, which as you can imagine, uh, June 2024 to, to that time frame in 2027, we're, we're right there. And, and that's the lead time, not to be lost in the fact that once we get, you know, and if we get an approval from EFSB, we have to digest the information. We have a process that typically takes, you know, a couple to four or five months to adopt conditions, adjust designs as needed to comply with the approval of the EFSB, as well as setting up the contracts with the vendors before we actually release those vendors to start to manufacture those materials. So our schedules are heavily dependent on that mid 2024 in service state. And I, I just wanna provide that additional context as, as to what's really driving our schedules. It's, you know, the, the line is certainly a, a heavy component, but right now it's, it's mainly the, those lead times associated with the major materials. Just um, maybe a small correction to your testimony. <laughs> you said it's dependent on a mid 2024 in service date. June, I think June 2024. 
June 2024, 20, not in service date, but citing board approval. Is that, that what you meant? Correct. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Rosenzweig. Thank you, Mr. Eck and Ms. Benjamin. Nothing further for the witnesses. At this time, does anyone have any questions based on the company's redirect with the knowledge that we will be holding another day of hearings at some yet undetermined date? I think Mr. Green is, okay. Mr. Eck, just really quickly, could you uh, just run through what types of major materials you're talking about in terms of procurement? Sure. So um, within this substation, uh, we have the 90 MVA power transformers. We have series and shunt reactors. We have uh, GIS equipment. There's a, there are a couple other packages as well, but those are the, the major materials that I'm referring to. Thank you. Does anyone have any additional questions? In that case, um, I believe we will close for the day. People will be sending me their um, schedule of dates with um, availability for their witnesses. And um, based on that, I will review what I get from people and set up a an additional hearing day. Is there anything else before we close? No, thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for the opportunity. I hope everyone has a good weekend. <laughs> and I I look forward to seeing everybody again in the near future to uh, to have a day where we clean up any remaining issues and set the briefing dates for this docket. Thank you, everyone. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.